Good morning, Harvest. My name's Simeon, and I'm so excited to join you in worship today. In Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5, David writes, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Our God is gracious and good, so let us raise our voices in praise of our great Savior this morning. glad you could join us to worship the Lord and if you are tuning in for the first time or have just been a, a regular viewer uh, watching us uh, the, on the live streams, we want to welcome you and uh, let you know that uh, you can contact us uh, through our website. If you go to our Harvest Fresno uh, website page, you could uh, fill out a contact uh, form and uh, let us know who you are. Uh, we would love to know, and uh, also you can fill out a prayer request, and we would uh, love to be able to uh, pray for you as well. <clears throat> you could even get connected into our small groups, and uh, that is something that uh, we highly value at our church as part of the discipleship-making process, so we would love to get you plugged in there as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Heavenly and gracious Father, thank you for this uh, time together where we can worship you. Uh, we are so grateful for this great privilege, and uh, we realize, Lord, that uh, you first loved us, that we would never have turned to you, we would never have uh, sought you had it not been for your irresistible love and your irresistible grace that uh, just uh, overwhelmed us and uh, revealed yourself uh, to us through your Son, and we're so grateful for that. I pray, Lord, that this morning that your word would go forth and it would just truly uh, minister to all those who hear it, but also I pray, Lord, that if there is uh, just any um, improper teaching or understanding that exists, that I pray that it would just be your words that uh, just wash away any uh, heretical beliefs, anything that's uh, not from you, Lord. We pray that uh, it would be uh, the Holy Spirit that illumines us to your divine truth and nothing else. And uh, again, I thank you, Lord, for this time together. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. <clears throat> I don't have to uh, tell you that 2020 has been a remarkable year. I think I've addressed this theme a number of times during our sermons. But again, it is, a un it is an unusual year. It started off with these Australian fires and then that freakish helicopter crash. Uh, taking Kobe Bryant's life and uh, the life of many others, including his daughter. Uh, then you had um, the COVID, uh, and the, the whole the racial divisions and the riots and all sorts of things, even locusts. <laughs> there are locusts that devastated crops in, in North Africa and in the, in the Middle East as well. And it, and it caused a bunch of memes to uh, show up, like, like this one here. Like, what's next? And it's kind of interesting, it just that, that idea alone, looking at the book of Revelation for what's next, really implies a certain theology, uh, a certain eschatology. That's uh, just a... a big or fancy word for the doctrine of the end times, it implies a certain view of looking toward the end times. And most Christians in the United States, evangelical Christians, have a certain way of thinking about the end times. And it became a popular uh, in, uh, at a certain time in our history and became really mainstream uh, with Hal Lindsey's um, The Great Late uh, Planet Earth, which uh, sold, I believe, um, uh, 28 million copies, and it was one of the first religious books that was published by a secular author. Then uh, later you had the Left Behind series, which kind of popularized this idea of uh, the end times and Christians being raptured by, by Christ uh, during the, before the, the tribulation period. And uh, I think he sold up to 65 million copies in his uh, series, and a, a number of, actually two movies came out. I'd like you to uh, watch uh, a quick clip of, a, of one of his movies. Are you kidding me? You're all we've talked about. He said that you were the greatest baseball player in the whole world. And you know what? What? He's right. <laughs> I love you.
So that may be a, a common understanding for you. Uh, what if both pilots were Christians? In that case, it would have been a completely different movie, but that's uh, going in a different direction. But this is kind of the, the main understanding of, of most believers, and uh, this is something that may have even you watched as a, uh, the first version as a, as a child and maybe got scared and, and even turned to the Lord because of it. But, and you can see, uh, to this day, uh, bumper stickers, or in this case, a window sticker warning people that the driver of this vehicle may disappear because of the rapture. Again, this is a belief in a pre-tribulation rapture theory, meaning that the rapture, the taking of uh, believers by Christ, is uh, something that's going to be done in secret and done before the tribulation period. That is what most Christians believe. Now, the question that I have for you is, that what, is that what the Bible teaches? Where did this theory come and its origin take place? How, how did this all happen? Well, it's important to know. And this is a portion of Scripture that we've landed on in our uh, sermon series, Standing Firm from 2 Thessalonians. And we are now chapter 2, and Paul really addresses this issue because a number of the uh, people in uh, the church that he was writing to were confused about this issue, about when, when is Jesus coming back? What is that going to look like? And so they wanted to know. They were confused, and they were troubled, and there was false teaching that was taking place surrounding this topic. So he writes this letter to really clarify and to instruct the church about when Jesus is coming back. So let's read from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to read the entire passage to give you context, but we're only going to be looking at uh, the first couple of verses this morning. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you th these things? And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is an activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and to be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who do not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So, from this passage, we're going to look at how to prepare for the end times. How to prepare for the end times. And you have to remember, <clears throat> this is coming after Paul wrote the first letter to the Thessalonians, where he talked about the coming of the Lord and our gathering together with him in the air. And then he talked about the day of the Lord. And so he already addressed this issue in the first letter that he wrote them. And then there was confusion, and we're going to learn that there was some false teaching after that, which caused this great confusion. And so he writes to this church, this second letter, to encourage them as, uh, of course, the persecution against them intensified but and also to clarify this error that they are believing. I want us to take a quick look at what came right before this. Paul, in the first uh, chapter, did talk about the coming of the Lord as well. And if you remember, he talked about the coming of the Lord to execute judgment 
on both the believers and unbelievers. For the believers, he was going to reward them and to afflict those who afflict the church. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses um, 5 to 7, he talks about that righteous judgment, and he says, I will repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted, as well as to us, again, talking to the Christians that are present. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fires, inflicting vengeance on those who don't know God and on those who don't obey the gospel. So you see here that when Jesus comes, he's coming with a blazing fire with angels, and he's going to inflict vengeance. That is the relief that the Christian is going to receive. And then after that, he he writes, Now, in uh, chapter 2, verse uh, verse 1, now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together with him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by spirit or the spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So we're looking at how to prepare for end times. And the first thing that we're going to do is rely on the word of God, not men. We have to rely on the word of God and not men. They are being confused by men. Our church today is being confused by men. We need to look at the Word of God and see what the Word of God tells us about this subject. And so he presents the issue in a pretty straightforward manner. It has to deal with the coming of our Lord and our being gathered together with Him. The confusion was that people were saying that the day of the Lord had already come. Now, he wrote 1 Thessalonians because he got word from Timothy that there was confusion regarding the day of the Lord and the, uh, our, the, our gathering together with Christ, saying that they thought that maybe those who were uh, dead are going to miss the day of the Lord. And so he wrote 1 Thessalonians and talked about our gathering and our resurrection with Christ in the air as part of, the, to correct the misunderstanding that the dead are going to miss uh, the, the resurrection and the rapture. And so that was what the, he wrote about in the first letter. So now the error that he's addressing here is and the error concerning that the day of the Lord has already come. And <clears throat> again, this is the coming of the Lord, which is uh, in the Greek called uh, parousia. And this is really the presence of the Lord. And <clears throat> this is something, the same word, the same topic is, has already been addressed in, uh, for example, 1 Thessalonians. He talked about the coming of the Lord in chapter 3, verse uh, 13, where he talked about that, the, uh, that uh, Christ may uh, establish your hearts blameless and holy before God the Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with the saints, our coming with the saints. That's the parousia. In, again, 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, chapter 4, verses uh, 15 to 17, he talks about this, and we're going to deal with this in greater detail. And then, of course, here in chapter 2, verse 1, and then later in verse 8, he talks about our coming in uh, the coming of the Lord. And this is the same, exact same thing that, he's talk- that he talked about, that Jesus actually talked about, in what's called the Olivet Discourse, where the disciples ask, so when is the destruction going to come, and and when are you coming back? And so he addressed that issue with them and gave a lengthy discourse called the Olivet Discourse, which we'll look at in a little bit. But the whole point is that he was talking about his coming, his parousia. So we're all talking about the exact same events here. There's the same word that's used for all three events. So the aspect that he's talking about here is the confusion is that the day of the Lord has already come. And so <clears throat> what's important to understand is that he links here something that's very important. He's linking the concerning our coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together with him. That's one event. And the grammar of the text suggests that it has to be one event. There's something in Greek called uh, the Granville Sharp Rule, which means that if there's one article the, the, that governs two nouns and it's at the first noun, then it, the, the two events are linked. 
And that's what he's saying here. So there are some who say, now concerning our coming of the Lord, that's one event. That could be the, the, the pre-trib rapture, and, uh, or excuse me, the uh, second coming, and then our being gathered is, is the pre-trib rapture. That can't be. The, the grammar of this is we're talking about one singular event that's taking place. And <laughs> this is something, again, that was already described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses um, 16 to 17, where Paul writes, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of a command and with a voice of an archangel and with the sound of a trumpet of God, and the dead um, in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up uh, together with, uh, with them in the clouds to meet him, the Lord in the air so that we will always be with the Lord. So, he's talking about this same event. He describes the Lord coming and gathering the saints. And <clears throat> you have to see here that <clears throat> he, he's just continuing this whole theme. And then he continues here, now concerning the coming of our Lord, in our, in our chapter here, of the Lord and are being gathered together with him, same event. We ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind, alarmed, or either uh, by spirit or spoken word or letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has already come. So he's saying, don't be shaken in mind. Um, this is agitated. This is a, a word that was used of uh, ships that were displaced from its, um, their uh, mooring due to a storm. And this alarm is, is this uh, word for like being uh, crying or wailing, to, uh, being so frightened that you're, you're crying out to the Lord. And it's a, in the present tense, it's a continual state of agitation and that even fear and anxiety that they are experiencing. They're, they're rattled and they are deeply distressed about this issue. And so he writes to them about the issue is that the Lord, the, uh, that the Lord has already come, that the day of the Lord has already come. And how they learn this? By three different ways. One, by spirit, said that we don't be alarmed, either by spirit, spoken word, or letter. So three different ways that this could have been communicated to them. Spirit, and that's probably prophecy. And this is something that uh, John, the Apostle John, warned the church against in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, where he said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come uh, in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. It's the spirit of the Antichrist. So it could have been from a spirit of, of prophecy. It could have been a spoken word. A spoken word is a, just a message. It could have been a sermon or, or a teaching, just gathering together and someone teaching this. Or letters, letter, it says, or, or letter seeming to be from us, which means that it was a false letter. It was an apocryphal letter. It was a, a forged letter that was from either Paul or, or Timothy or Silas saying that the, the Lord has already come. And those were frequent. Those uh, letters were circulated. And if you wrote uh, someone who had authority on it, then people would think that it came from that person. And so <laughs> that's how the error came to be. So what was the nature of the error? What was the nature of the error? Well, that the day of the Lord had already come. Oh, how could they think that? Because the teaching is that we're going to be gathered together where there's going to be a resurrection of the dead and we're going to be gathered together. All the Christians are going to be gathered together with Christ in the air. So how in the world can they think that the day of the Lord has already come? Well, only one of three, three ways, really. And... One looks at this, that the day of the Lord has come. Again, it's a perfect tense, and uh, that's in the fact that it happened in the past, that the, the day of the Lord has already come in, in the past. And this is something that, um, so this idea that Jesus has already come can, o can only be here in a sense, in a spiritual sense. And that was an error that existed among the Corinthian church, and even uh, Paul wrote that in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 18. And this is something called an over-realized eschatology. 
uh, an over-realized eschatology. It's where someone ex uh, thinks that these events that were prophesied about the end times have already been fulfilled. Another word for that is preterism. Preterism. And that comes again from the latter, from the uh, Latin that uh, preter is, is the past. And it's the idea that the prophecies have already been fulfilled. So <clears throat> in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 18, Paul writes, But avoid irreverent babble, for will lead a people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. So this idea that the resurrection has already happened, the idea is that it must have happened in a spiritual sense, in a spiritual sense, that the resurrection happened, that we are, in a sense, resurrection upon belief with Christ, that, that our, uh, we're taught that even in the Bible, that our spirit is, is raised with, with Christ. So they're saying that everything that's happening here with the coming of the Lord and our being resurrected is all done in a spiritual sense, and this fits the Greek philosophy of the time, which was kind of like an incipient Gnosticism that believed that, um, that it was only that which is spiritual that would pertain to God, and anything in the body, anything physical was evil. So only the spiritual was good, and the body and physical things are evil. And if that's the case, then all this is happening in the spiritual realm, not the physical realm. Okay, so in which case, it led to all sorts of debauchery, because it didn't matter what you did in the body, because that didn't matter. Anyways, so that is probably the belief that they had, that the resurrection, if they were being taught that the day of the Lord had already come, that it was taught in a spiritual sense. But there's also another way that this could be understood. That the day of the Lord uh, was eminent, was eminent, because there's a way of taking this um, past perfect sense and treating it that it's um, in a uh, what's called in a transitive sense that it's going to be happening soon. So it could be that they were taught that the day of the Lord is happening like tomorrow, the next day, and so they were all agitated and worried about that. So that is really the two main er uh, errors that I could think of. There's another one that uh, is possible, and they just thought that it was a secret rapture, that, the, you know, the, it, he could have come for some people, but they obviously were left behind, and that was it. So we don't know, but to whatever extent, and however, whichever it is, it's relating to the fact that the day of the Lord had already come, or was about to come, and they were, you know, they were in the potential of... Uh, of missing it. So, he continues in this letter in verse 3, where he says, let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come, the day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, will not come unless rebellion comes first. The man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship. And later in verse 7, only he who now restrains it will do so until he's out of the way. So we see kind of like these three things, that the, there's going to be this apostasy, there's going to be this rebellion, and then there's going to be the Antichrist who's revealed, and kind of like this restraining influence is going to be removed. So he's not coming back until those three things happen. And so this is absolutely consistent with what is being taught in the Word of God every other place where, the, where this is really addressed. When the Olivet Discourse, again, um, when Jesus addressed the disciples at the Olivet Discourse, asking, when will these things come in, the, the sign of, uh, of the uh, coming of, of the end of the age, right? It's consistent. This is what's called the post-tribulation view, the post-tribulation view. And so I'd like to just show you this chart of the different views you could see that one is a pre-tribulation, and that's where you see the cross and then the church age, and then the rapture of the church before the tribulation, and then Jesus comes right after the tribulation, and then there's a millennial kingdom that's set up on earth for a thousand years and then judgment and eternity. The, there's another view called the mid-tribulation view, and that means that uh, Christ comes for his bride, the church, in the middle of the tribulation. And then there's a, the severe part of the tribulation happens, and then the second coming of Christ, and then the millennial. 
Um, then you have the post-tribulation period, and that is where the tribulation, uh, you see the cross, then you see the entire church age and the tribulation take place, and then Christ comes, and then you have the millennial kingdom. So those are the, the three uh, main views, the mid-trib less than uh, these other two views, but uh, those are the, the views that exist. So the question is, what is true? What is true? Well, and, and where did the pre-tribulation theory come from? If what we've looked at so far is Jesus was saying the Antichrist has to come first and the rebellion has to come first, that, that's all happening in the tribulation, after the tribulation, I mean, when the tribulation period is, is happening, right in the middle of the tribulation. So that is going to happen. He said these things have to happen before he comes back. So everything that we're taught here, and you look at uh, uh, the Olivet Discourse again, which we'll look at in, in more detail, but all those things are just a post-tribulation. So what about this pre-tribulation that most people believe? Well, I've uh, shared this before, but uh, again, when I came to faith, I didn't know anything about the faith. I didn't have any preconceived ideas about what a Christian was. What a, I didn't even know the difference between a Catholic and a, and a, and a Protestant. And so I went to a uh, seminary and uh, online, and not online, they didn't have computers, but uh, correspondence, and took classes, and I went to a conservative Baptist uh, seminary, uh, the only one that was accredited at the time that I could take correspondence classes from. And uh, the pre-tribulation was the, what they taught. But I also would look at everything else. I looked at other material, and I wanted to know what was true. So I'd always look at my Bible, because I didn't know anything. And so I was, was presented with a doctrine. I would examine to see, you know, whether it was true or not. And I just marched through all the different do major doctrines of the Bible, and I just uh, took that, and, and we had a good library that was donated to the... Uh, uh, the prison uh, uh, chapel and uh, a lot of reform books, and I actually thought I was going to lean that direction because I, I, I kind of valued what those uh, reformers uh, taught. It was sound theology, so I thought I was going to uh, believe more towards what they thought. But as I read, I just didn't see it in the Bible. They taught all millennialism, which believes that they didn't believe in the 1,000-year reign of Christ on earth, and I saw that all over uh, the Bible in Revelation. Six times it's mentioned, so I said, well, if it's there, why, why say that it doesn't exist? And the son thought, okay, well, I'll be pre-trib, and then I looked in the Bible, and I just didn't see it. I didn't, I didn't see the evidence in the Bible showing that it was true. Now, this is not a doctrine to divide over. This is not uh, an issue dealing with salvation. This is a, a secondary uh, issue. And so if you believe the, the pre-tribulation theory and um, you still end up believing it after we're done with the series, then that's fine. Um, again, I think I've shared this before. Uh, I don't even know what all of our uh, elders and deacons believe about this issue because it's not an issue that determines the, the fate of the church or it's not, a self, uh, again, a, an issue for salvation. Uh, I care about a theology of suffering, that people have a correct understanding of, of God and His sovereignty and, and how that works. But this is, again, not an issue for us to divide on. So I just want to um, make that clear. So <clears throat> what does, um, how do we get here? How do we get here? Where, where did this theory come from? I want us to, and again, I've, I've shared this before, I want you to just remove whatever preconceived ideas you have about the doctrine of the end times, and let's just look at the Word of God. Again, the first point of how to prepare for the end times is rely on the Word of God, not of men. So, in a sense, why do I not believe the pre-trib theory? Well, because it's the tradition of man. The historicity of it shows that it's the tradition of man. If you were born prior to 1830, you would have never have heard about a pre-tribulation rapture theory. It did not exist in the church for the first 1800 years post-Christ. That's a long time. Nowhere. There's not a shred of evidence in any church uh, writing about the pre-tribulation theory. It, um, in fact, the church fathers believed in a post-tribulation 
theory. Uh, the um, Didache or Didache, however you want to pronounce it, and there's about five different pronunciations of this. It's an early church document, dated about 100 AD of church practices. And in that, it talks about uh, the church being gathered together with the elect after the tribulation. Uh, the epistle of Barnabas in 100 AD talked about uh, the last times and the Antichrist that the Christians are going to be interacting with the Antichrist. Justin Martyr in 110 um, to 165 AD talked about uh, these things about, uh, against the Most High um, and, um, and the deeds of the uh, Antichrist against Christians. So again, being present, that's part of, that of, of the tribulation period. Uh, Irenaeus. Uh, on 120 to 130 A.D., talked about who was a disciple of Polycarp, who was taught by the Apostle John, also talked about the beast and the church fighting the beast. Uh, Tertullian also talked about this and uh, equated the uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 17, which we read, with Daniel chapter 7, which talked about, again, the uh, coming of Christ. And, um, and so... All of these early church fathers talked about the, uh, the rapture, the coming of Christ, with thinking that they were going through a tribulation. So then where did this come from? Again, 1830 is about the first time that we see this happening. Uh, from the 1820s to the 1830s in England, there was uh, kind of this prophetic fever that existed uh, end time fever, and uh, so they had all these different conferences, and uh, there was uh, this one um, a woman, Margaret MacDonald, who was sick and supposedly had a, a vision, and she wrote uh, this individual named Irving about, uh, about her, her beliefs, and, and in this belief, it was that the church, um, the church was uh, actually the Spirit-filled Christians were going to be taken uh, by the Lord when she was talking about the Church of Philadelphia, and that that only the Spirit-filled Christians were going to be taken by the Lord, and the rest were going to remain. So it was only this elite group of Christians that were going to be uh, raptured by the Church uh, prior to the coming of the Antichrist. And um, Irving then... Uh, wrote and was really moved by this teaching and incorporated this teaching in his own church. And so the first thing that we have is uh, the uh, Morning Watch, which was a newsletter put out by the Irvinites, which talked about, again, this Philadelphian church, the Spirit-filled church being raptured prior to the tribulation and the Laodicean church uh, representing the rest of Christianity remaining. And that spread all around. And that got uh, spread to someone by the name of uh, uh, John Nelson Darby, who was one of the founders of the Plymouth Brethren. And uh, he started uh, systematizing this teaching and uh, wrote about it. And uh, that became uh, kind of what most people believe. But I want you to know that at the time that it was embraced by this small group, there were conservative Orthodox Christians that were saying, this is not true. This is not true. Um, Samuel Tregellis, who was a uh, uh, Plymouth um, Brethren uh, theologian, uh, wrote that, uh, <clears throat> but when this theory of the secret coming of Christ was first brought forward about 1832, it was adopted with eagerness. And then he writes, I'm not aware that there was any definite teaching that there would be a secret rapture of the church at a secret, uh, at a secret coming until this was given forth in utterance in Mr. Irving's church from which what was uh, there received to be the voice of the Spirit. It came not from the Holy Scripture, but from that which was falsely pretended to be a Spirit of God. And he wrote that in the Hope of Christ's Second Coming in 1864. Um, George Mueller, who many of you know had uh, that orphanage and uh, had uh, his, in his autobiography, talks about how he depended wholly on the Lord for prayer, uh, to, uh, by prayer to receive funds for the operation of the, of the orphanage. Uh, he wrote that, uh, my brother and I am a constant reader of the Bible. And as soon as I found out that I was taught, this is talking about Darby, uh, as soon as I was taught to believe, um, excuse me, 
And I soon found out what I was taught to believe did not always agree with what my Bible said. I came to see that I must either part company with what uh, John Darby uh, or my precious Bible, and I chose to cling to my Bible and part from Mr. Darby. So you see that it was highly contentious, and, um, and this was a new teaching. And there was a saying that if it's new, it's not true. So again, 1800 year, over 1,800 years of, of this teaching and uh, of not finding this teaching anywhere. And uh, another uh, lawyer uh, who became part of the uh, Plymouth Brethren who went with uh, uh, Darby and then left uh, said uh, these words um, that looking back, excuse me, went with Irving, and uh, looking back he said that he'd been deceived by lying spirits pretending to be the Holy Spirit. So my point here is that the origin of the pre-tribulation rapture is a very late doctrine. Uh, it's highly dubious in how it came to, to be in existence. It didn't come from exegesis. It, it, it came from this belief that, and, uh, that this was going to happen. And so um, I'm just encouraging you to be a Berean. Don't rely on the tradition of man, but on the Word. Uh, don't even rely on what I am teaching you. Look for yourself at the Word of God to see what God is teaching you about this subject. And that should be for everything. And so, again, uh, just a warning, be careful of your presupposition. Be careful of what you already believe to be true. Try to just say, I believe the Bible is true, and just look at clearly what the Bible has to say. And so, I, again, I don't believe in pre-tribulation rapture because it relied on the tradition of men, which I have um, shown you, and it's not in the Bible. This is the second reason why I don't believe it, it's just I can't find it anywhere in the Bible. And so forget what men say. Let, what about what the Bible says? That's what we should be looking at. And so let's just let the Scripture do the talking. So I just want to run through some Scriptures with you very quickly and uh, take a look. We, we looked at, again, 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. We, we looked at what Paul taught about the end times in those, in those two scriptures. But what was the body of truth? Though that's an early book. The 1 Thessalonians is one of the earliest books of the Bible. And the only other teaching that could have really been uh, transmitted is either by what Paul told them directly, and that was most likely uh, along the lines of what he had been taught through the gospel, through the Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse is what Jesus taught about the end times, was the, the, the clearest and uh, the most extensive teaching of the end times that we could find anywhere really in the, in the Bible apart from the book of Revelation. And so in that, uh, Jesus is sitting uh, on Mount of Olives with his uh, disciples, and they're looking at the temple of Jerusalem, kind of just like glistening in the sunshine with its golden, golden roof and white marble. And they're looking and they're saying, like, when is this destruction going to happen? When is it going to be the coming of the end of the age? So they asked Jesus that question. And Jesus answered them and said, well, see that no one leads you astray. Again, there's this... Uh, there's this understanding that there's going to be a lot of false teaching surrounding the end times. He's saying, don't let anyone lead you astray. And there's going to be many in my uh, name saying that, um, that I am the Christ, and they'll lead him away. And then he goes on to describe that um, these things have to happen before he returns. And he talks about the false prophets, and he talks about the Antichrist being revealed. Again, following exactly with what we just uh, uh, read in uh, 2 Thessalonians, and there's going to be false Christs and false prophets performing miracles, and then there's going to be this great tribulation. And <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 24, verse 27 says, For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Again, the parousia, the coming of our Lord. And then verse 29 is what you have here. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will descend out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So we see here, again, this is the same teaching about the same coming of the Lord, the only coming of the Lord that's ever described in Scripture here. And so this um, was it until 1 Thessalonians. And again, 
He addressed that issue thinking that, well, they, that what's going to happen to the dead when Jesus comes back? Like he, like he was going to say, he's coming back. And so he wrote, again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where he says, I don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about all those who fall asleep. You know, don't grieve like they have no hope. Verse 15, for this we declare to you by the word of God, that um, we who are alive, who are left until the coming of our Lord, again, coming of our Lord is peru perusia, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. And here's the key verse, verse 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of a command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of a trumpet of God, and the dead of Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. So you see the dead and, uh, and Christians rising first, then those who are alive are being caught in the air, describing exactly what we just read in the Olivet Discourse. Then... Paul addresses uh, this other heresy this, of the Corinthians saying that there's no resurrection. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 to 52, he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will rise, uh, be raised imperishable and we shall all be changed. So again, here's this idea of the rapture taking place. And we have new bodies. This is all taking place in a twinkling of an eye. When at the last trumpet, the trumpet, the trumpet will sound. Last trumpet. Seventh trumpet. So if you look at these verses that we just read, the Olivet Discourse, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 to 17, and this 1 Thessalonians chapter um, 15, 52, they're all called the parousia, the coming of the Lord. Uh, you see Jesus coming in the clouds in all of them, them coming in the clouds. You see the angels present in the Olivet Discourse and in uh, 1 Thessalonians. You see, you hear about the great sound of a trumpet, <clears throat> and you see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Then the gathering of the elect in all of them here, that the gathering of the elect, and we're caught up to meet him, and then the dead will be raised. All of this, again, talking about the exact same event. And again, I remind you, in 2 Thessalonians, the letter that we're on, in the first chapter, again, <laughs> what he talks about is when Jesus comes back, he's going to afflict those who afflict him, and he's revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. He's coming back with flaming fire. He's not, there's never this time where he's talking about he's going to come back secretly for the church and no one's going to know about it. He's coming back with flaming fire. This is talking about giving relief to, to the believers. Where's this relief coming from? Not through an, a, a secret pre-tribulation rapture where we're going to avoid and be delivered from any pain. No, it's going to happen when Jesus comes back with mighty angels to to uh, afflict those, uh, those unbelievers. That's the only thing we see. That's what's consistent in the Word of God. And then right after 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that we read about uh, the dead being raised first and then, and then believers, Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now, Concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. For while people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, that for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then he's talking about the day of the Lord, that the timing of this, this gathering together with the saints. He said it's going to come on unbelievers like a thief in the night, but you are not. You are not going to be caught unaware because you are a child of the day, not a child of the night. And you have to remember, this is one, one letter there were no chapter divisions, right? So he's talking about being gathered together with Christ in the air. Then he says, now concerning the times. And so what, what pre-tribulation 
believers hold is that 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is talking about the rapture. This is talking about the second coming. Two completely different events they're saying are, are, is taking place. And my question is, why would you say that? What, what evidence is there to say that th this is talking about a completely different event when it's coming right on the heels of what he's talking about, what they're saying is the rapture, and there's no, nothing to suggest that this is a different event other than it's a preconceived belief that you have that it must be a different event. Now, there's actually information saying that it's not a different event. The, if you notice in chapter 1, verse, uh, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, it begins with, now concerning the time. So, again, he's going right into this situation where he talks about those who are alive and left together are caught in the air and, um, and will be with the Lord always. Therefore, encourage uh, one another with these words. Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no... Again, it just, it's a one letter that goes like that. And that word now is... Uh, in the Greek, they have what's called a strong adversative and a weak adversative. A strong adversative, if, there's a, if it's a completely different event, there is a way of saying that in, in the Greek, and it's a strong adversative. It's just, just that it's a, it's a different thing. So there's a, there's a word to say uh, now or another, um, let me have another piece of the same pie, or there's another way of saying I want something entirely different. It's a weak adversative. It, it, it's suggesting just a flow from what preceded it. It's not talking about a different event. So grammatically, it doesn't even fly that they're talking about a different event. So not only do you have to import that understanding to the text, because there's nothing in the text that suggests it, but also the grammar of, the, of this passage suggests that it can't, be the, it can't be true. So then you say, well, is that it? Is that for the, for where the pre-tribulation theory come from in terms of the Scripture? Is that it? Well, there's another portion of Scripture that I'll go over quickly. It's Revelation chapter 3, verse 8 to 11. It's actually verse 10. That's their key verse, where John is writing to the church in Philadelphia. He says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an, an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, yet you've kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those who, a synagogue of Satan who say that uh, they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about um, patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what I have to say, what, I, um, what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. So they're saying, well, see, He's saying that they're going to be kept from the hour of trouble. Uh, the issue, he's talking about believers who kept his word, and he's saying, I will keep you. And that word, keep, does not mean deliverance. Uh, they, they say that um, kept, keep out means that you are delivered and, and translated, but that is not at all what is uh, being taught in, in the slightest bit. Um, you see here that in, first, in, um, in John chapter, uh, in John chapter seven, uh, 17, verse 15, that same word is used, keep. And he says, uh, Jesus says, I do not ask that you take them out of this world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Same word. What does keep them from the evil one mean? Does it mean that, it, that we're going to be delivered and, and translated from the evil one? No, that we're going to be able to endure, that we're going to be given the power to, to persevere, and that's what he's talking about here. And just lastly, understand that this is not taught outside the Western church, the pre-tribulation theory. People are being persecuted and going through uh, tribulations around the world. You, you, you can't say to someone in, in the Sudan who's losing his head or her head because of their faith in Christ that God will protect them, God will deliver them. There's, there's no understanding whatsoever of a pre-tribulation rapture. There's no teaching of deliverance, there's teaching of endurance. The entire Bible 
the, the, the New Testament, what Jesus says about uh, us, that, you know, there will be uh, tribulation in this world, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome. And that overcoming is giving us the power to persevere. This whole part in 1 Thessalonians was talking about them, Jesus rewarding them with, with the power to persevere and endure the suffering that they were enduring. That is, that is a, a common theme throughout Scripture. I'd like to read and close on a portion of what Corey Ten Boom wrote, who again, was a young child, went, uh, was in concentration camps. She witnessed her, uh, her family uh, being killed, in a sense, by the, by the Nazis, especially her sister, uh, Betsy. And in 1974, she writes the following. There are some among us teaching that there will be no tribulation, that the Christians will be able to escape all of this, These are false teachers that Jesus was warning us to expect in the latter days. Most of them have little knowledge of what is already going on across the world. I have been in countries where saints are already suffering terrible persecution. In China, the Christians were told, don't worry, before the tribulation comes, you'll be translated, raptured. Then came terrible persecution. Millions of Christians were tortured to death. Later, I heard from a bishop in China, sadly, we have failed. We should have made the people strong for persecution rather than telling them that Jesus would come first. Tell the people how to be strong in times of persecution, how to stand when tribulation comes, to stand and not faint. I feel I have a divine mandate to go and tell people of this world that it is possible to be strong in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are training for the tribulation, but more than 60% of the body of Christ across the world has already entered into the tribulation. There is no way to escape it. We are next. And that's my burden for you, is to understand that God will provide whatever we need to persevere. And the worst thing is to think that you are not going to have to deal persecution or the tribulation or difficulty, that God will deliver you. I... I've had numerous conversations with people of, about this doctrine. I say, point, give me a scripture. Tell me why you believe this. And they can't do it. They just say, God wouldn't let his, his children suffer. And that's just totally contrary to what we have seen throughout church history, including the apostles. So I just want to encourage you with this, that God will provide everything you need. And also we're going to look in the, in the next um, verses here about the Antichrist. There's a lot of misunderstanding, again, about the Antichrist, and we're just going to look at what the Bible says about the Antichrist. Who is he? Where does he come from? All of those things are revealed in the Word of God. We don't have to rely on the cover of Time magazine or some some blog to tell us who's the the Antichrist or is he here or not. We don't have to wonder because the Bible's very clear, and we're going to look at that next. So let's go to the Lord in prayer now. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. And I just pray, Lord, that you equip us, uh, strengthen us, uh, give us uh, everything that we need to persevere and endure. I just pray that we have eyes to to see you, ears to hear you. I pray, Lord, that if there's anything that I have said that is not true, that that it would just fall on deaf ears. But Lord, if there's things that, that I'm saying that we have looked at through your word of God that is true, I pray that it would just resonate and um, work in uh, individuals' hearts. And I know this is something that they have not, uh, may have not been taught or contrary to what they've been taught. And I just pray that, that the Holy Spirit would do the work that he does, which is illumine our, heart, our hearts and our minds to your truth. And any type of heresy, anything that false teaching would just be washed away by, by your love, by your grace, and by your truth. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen.
Well, thank you for joining us. And if you know anyone who would benefit from hearing this message, then I want to encourage you to share it. And uh, just know again that uh, we love you. And uh, we, again, are not going to divide on this issue. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, and we could grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord together regardless of this issue. So I want to encourage you to continue to tune in if you uh, are having a hard time. And again, we're going to go over uh, more of this uh, in the following weeks when we uh, unpack the rest of the chapter. Until then, know that you are loved.